in the answer to, to our second question here, what would be your advice to Tim Cook? If they only care about total revenue, then the total revenue uh, should go up when you um, decrease the price or that should decrease the price. And the last part said, if you did not know the price of elasticity of iPads and we'll have to guess, would you guess the demand for iPads was price elastic or inelastic? This is more of a personal question. But um, if, if I were going to uh, take a guess on this, what are the things I would try to look at? Well, the main thing you will try to look at is how many substitutes are there for iPads. Because the more substitutes people have, the more responsive the demand for iPad is going to be. Or the more, or in other words, the more elastic it's going to be. So if the price of iPads increase, let's say, by 10 or 15 percent or 20 percent, demand, the consumption or people you know, are going to switch from iPads, the more substitutes they have. So you have to answer yourself, you have to, you know, to answer this question, do, do people have a lot of substitutes right now for iPads? And, you know, it's hard to say. Uh, it's definitely, a, it's a lot of personal preference, but it, it does seem to, you know, there, there is certain uh, signs out there that tell us that people really think the iPad is a little special right now. There hasn't been a, a, a product that has that had really caught up as much as the iPad. And the iPhone, I think Android is, is definitely making a big, um, push for competing with iPad and they are definitely getting a lot of market share and, and you see a lot of um, people buying Android phones but with iPads at least that is my personal view I don't see a lot of uh, people buying other type of tablets than the iPad in fact the HP came out with a tablet about, about a, a, month, a, month, a month and a half ago and the sales were so uh, were so bad that they actually decided to scratch the project and, and not continue to produce it so I think for, for some reason um, uh, people seem to think that the iPad is, is way better than the other products. And, and in that sense, if that's the case, then one would tend to suggest that, that, um, that the elasticity for iPad is actually inelastic. Now, but there's other things out there too. Now, clearly, um, you know, you can think that uh, laptops are a substitute for iPads. And there will be more and more substitute, the more and more the, uh, the price of the iPad changes. If the price of the iPads go up, let's say, to $1,000, I think a lot of people are going to basically say, well, you know, I'm using my iPad to see movies uh, when I'm on the plane. The iPad is too expensive. I'd just rather be my laptop, right? So uh, uh, it's, not a, it's not an exact substitute, but it, it could be a substitute for the iPad, particularly the more, the, the more and more the price would change. So if we think that people see laptops as a clear substitute for iPads, then we will tend to think that the elasticity for iPad is more elastic. And, and a dramatic decrease on the price will in fact increase the total revenue. So, um, so this is a good question. I, I tend to think that, um, that if you decrease the price of iPad by 30%, uh, you will actually gain a lot, of, um, a lot of revenue because a lot of people will actually be able to afford the iPads and they will switch from, from laptops to, to bring in iPads with them all the time. Now the question is, oh, clearly they cannot reduce the, the price by 30%. There are other things in play here, and that's the cost of production. But, um, but I, t I tend to think that if the iPads are reduced, the price of the iPads would by 30%, you probably get an increase in sales that is actually larger than 30%. All right, so let's go forward with this. What was the next question we had? All right, so we ended the price ceilings here. We did this question in class. Suppose that, they go, that to control rising health costs, government set the maximum price for a normal doctor visit at $20, but the current market price is $40. Now, as a result of this, what will happen? Well, as a result of this, we, 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 should, we should see that the doctors are starting seeing fewer patients. And the best way to see this is actually with the diagram. The diagram doesn't help all the time, but I think in this particular case, um, it does help. This is kind of the market for doctors here, the simulated market for doctors. The prices, the market price could be theoretically $40. Now the government comes and put it a, a price ceiling that is below that, and it's called the price ceiling because the price is not allowed to go higher than that. Well, not a lot of doctors. I mean, they have a lot of, they have high costs to providing medicine. They, they paid a lot of money on going to school. It costs a lot of money to maintain the office, to pay the personnel and stuff. So a lot of them actually are not gonna be able to provide um, medicine or to see patients at that lower price, they might actually go and do something else. Doctors who are ready to retire, they might retire. Um, doctors who perhaps are thinking of um, just finish school, they might decide to uh, not, not go into their private practice and so forth and so forth. Right? So the, 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 the end result of this is that there will, there's def definitely going to be a pressure of some doctors to get out of the business. There's no pressure on any doctor to actually go into medicine. 
So the quantity supply of visits is actually going to go down. Now, at the same time, since the cost of seeing the doctor is lower, you're going to have more people actually wanting to see the doctor. And the result of these two things, a lower uh, reduction in the quantity of supply and increase in the quantity demanded, is that there's going to be an, a shortage of, of, of supply. There's going to be more people following the good than people willing to provide it. So that's kind of answer the question is that the doctor will see fewer patients. Now, um, a little add on to this question is that if we wanted to calculate, well, what is the loss of welfare to society? Then we have to think about why the loss is, why is society losing here? And clearly the, the big loss in, in, to society is that there's gonna be less people seeing the doctor. Now before it was about, well, we say it was around here, right? Um, if we come up with a number between 20 and 80, let's say, you know, that it was 50, then, then clearly before there were about there were 50 people seeing the doctor. Now there's only 20 people seeing the doctor. So there's about, about 30 people here that are not seeing the doctor anymore. That is the loss to society. And we can calculate the actual value of that loss by going up, the, up to the demand curve and calculating that. And that's what we call the, the loss of welfare. It's, you know, the, that's a dollar value of the loss of welfare, which is basically the value that those 30 people had on those um, on those um, units that were lost. Okay, this is had to do with the minimum wage, which is now a price floor. In the U.S., most workers earn about $7.25 an hour. Therefore, the effect of a, of the recent increase of the federal minimum wage, which increased to $7.25 in the American economy, has been. Well, if most if, if the minimum wage increased to seven twenty five, but most people are already are earning seven twenty five, then that's gonna be very limited. In other words, if I am paying you eight dollars and the government come and tell me, Well, you have to pay someone at least seven twenty five, well the minimum wage is not gonna affect me at all, right? Because I'm already paying more than the minimum wage. Now we can see this also in the graph. If the minimum wage was six dollars and the government put a a floor, and I always a floor because the price cannot go uh, lower than that, of 725. If it's higher than the market price, yes, yeah, some people, some firms will have to fire some people because they will be, they're not going to be able to cover the cost at that high wage, and that will reduce the demand for workers. Now, workers are earning more, so a lot of them will go into the market to look for a job, and what you have here is unemployment, right? There's a lot, there's a lot less jobs available than people are looking for those jobs, and that's the result at least a theoretical result that you have a minimum wage that is higher than the market price. But the case in the U.S. Uh, is that most people actually earn more than the minimum wage, at least at 725. So if the government says, I say, well, you have to pay 725, well, most people are already paying $9, so the wage is not going to go down to 725 because producers have already decided that paying $9 is actually what they should pay to hire the quality and the quantity of workers they want, given how much they s they're selling of their product. So this 725 price floor or minimum wage is not going to have any effect. It's already below the actual price. So when the minimum wage, when the price floor is below the market price, it has no effect. And just as a side note, this is also the kind of tantamount to a price ceiling being above the price that also has no effect. Okay, now um, if we do have to come up with some some people that are going to be affected more by the minimum wage, well, they have to be those people who are more likely to be earning a lower wage or a wage that is lower than the minimum wage. And those are not going to be skilled workers. Those are going to be probably unskilled workers, young people who have not ha haven't had a bachelor's degree or don't have a lot of experience are probably going to be those that may be earning less than 725. So those people will be perhaps affected by the minimum wage. So the answer here is unskilled workers are the ones that are gonna be more negatively affected by the minimum wage. Very skilled workers are probably not gonna be affected at all. Now the last thing about the uh, minimum wage and the price floor is that the price floor also reduces kind of the quality of the good. And we made the example of the airplanes is that when airplanes are forced, when airlines are forced to charge a hard price, um, they will, they're going to try to compete. They cannot compete with price. You see, they cannot try to get customers from other airlines by reducing the price. They're going to try to get customers from other airlines by actually providing, you know, really a lot of space and a very nice dinner with your flight and stuff. But when the, when the airlines are able to compete just on price, they're going to try to make 
efficient changes to their production so they can actually reduce the price, which is what, uh, what happened in the U.S. in the last 20 years. It's that the local airlines like Southwest and JetBlue and some of the other ones are really have been really the ones pushing kind of the airline industry into one direction, and that direction is lower, lower airfares. And that's why uh, today it's possible for most of us to actually fly a lot more frequently than our my parents or grandparents actually able to fly. So if, if we were actually going to go um, to a price floor, the the least result of this will be that um, that you you will not see narrow seats and basic meals like peanut peanut or or coffee or soda. What you will see in a price floor situation of airline will be uh, airlines um, replacing overnight with new aircraft. Uh, you would also see special incentive like airline mileage club to attract customer and you will also see excellent engine maintenance.